This is the e-procurement pre-training form, and we're going to talk about the requisitions and the shopping carts that you're now going to have access to. The things I'm going to cover today will be transaction types. I'm going to review that first because it's really out of the purchase order world now. And so I don't want you to have to like bring those transactions up as we talk because they're a whole different process. So I'm going to go over that. We're going to talk about requisition order business process. I'm sure you've seen that before. We're going to go over the bear buy catalogs and the shopping carts. Then I'm going to show you the standard requisition transition to the ePro requisition because it is different. And then the ePro requisition overview, where I, we're going to get into the detail of the pages. And then I'm going to do a walkthrough of two transactions. One, I'm going to demonstrate the UPK for creating a requisition as you do today for a non-catalog vendor. And then I'm going to show you the UPK for capturing a, a shopping cart, retrieving a shopping cart that someone on the staff has created, which is the other, one of the other ways you're going to be working. So we can go through that. And then we're going to talk about those training assignments I mentioned. And then Q&A at the end where we'll take any and all questions and I'll give you every answer I can without making any up, OK? <laughs> all right. Here's the direct voucher process. In the old system, these transactions, the ones that were highlighted in yellow and in bold, used to be low value purchase orders, OK? They made them now direct voucher process and took them out of the purchasing system because now we're going to a full-blown purchasing system based on requisitions. In the past, you did low-value orders for these, but now you don't have order access. So if you process journal subscriptions or on our area through the purchasing system, someone would have to do a receiving record. There is no real reason to do that. So I know some people feel like this is going back in time or going back to paper. It's a, it's a half step. We're going back to paper in that for any of these transactions that you see here, you're going to attach what we would typically call a check request or a payment request form. And they made one form, thank God, for everything. You check the box of what it is or whether to hold the check, and you attach what you need to have paid to it and submit that to disbursements. When that happens, these transactions go to voucher approval, like your utility bills always have. Okay? So when we took all the purchasing stuff out of voucher approval, now we're putting a little bit back. Okay, you with me on that? So when you do any of these transactions, you have to create a, a payment request form submitted to disbursements. Remember to keep a copy and most ideally give it to your voucher approver. I don't think any voucher approver should be approving anything unless they have the source documents to confirm what's being approved. And in that way, and I had some people early on in presentations say, well, how do I know they did it right? Well, when the approver sees it, they're going to confirm the payee and the amount and even the address, and go from there, OK? So that's still the old voucher approval process. So these things are never purchase orders anymore. And you'll see here the bold italic yellow is the ones that are all new to this process. And asterisk indicates those that they would be preferred to be paid by blue card if you have one within your department. Any questions about direct voucher process? The process includes the matrix that's posted, and there's the URL where the matrix is. And it provides transaction type, description, policy reference, and the support documentation required. It could be a little beefier in terms of the next steps, how to submit the stuff, and hopefully we'll get to that. But I think people are kind of picking that up now. In terms of the new form, I think if you go to that website where the matrix is, it will also direct you to the form. This presentation was developed before the uh, form was made, made available. So you can probably get it from this URL at the top. So let's move on to e-procurement. This was a two-stage process. When we went live July 6th, you all started as standard requisition departments in version 9. Okay? And in many ways, standard recs in version 9 was a small step from a, 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 a low-value order or a, even a requisition in the old system. But now we're going to migrate you to e-procurement, the full integrated product. And you're early adopters. You're in the first month of going live. So it's going to continue to transition through the end of the year. In fact, some of the business processes might change. So it is important that you all stay tuned to the BFS listserv so you can hear about those things. So in the past, I've shown you this schematic that talks about the business process. I'm going to walk through it again. But in reality, the only thing that's different is in the past, we had someone requesting, like this guy up here, 
up a step one, requesting a service that you would then create a requisition for. Now we're adding the shopping cart factor. That's all we're doing here. Everything else in terms of process stays the same. So if I could go through this process now, you'll see that either somebody in your department is requesting you buy something or someone created a shopping cart for you. You're going to create a, a, a requisition in e-procurement and submit it for approval. And then based on your org node identity, the right person will approve your requisition. The system will then convert it to a purchase order. Now understand that it's supposed to be pretty quick. So if it's direct to vendor, which is a low value order that doesn't require anyone, any central buyer to work on, would go to an order within the same day or the next day. Now there have been a situation now we're learning that people aren't finding the orders right away. Lo and behold, and I found out this uh, just this week, so it's important for you to know this, is if you do an after the fact or a special handling requisition, okay, those are being manually reviewed before releasing into a purchase order. So it's taking two to three days to have those become an order. So if you were to do an after the fact requisition for entertainment because you hold the invoice or a photographer that you hold the invoice for, you can't submit that invoice till you have that PO number. So it might take two or three days to get it before you can proceed. So then once you get the PO number, you submit the invoice and do the receiving record in BFS. So after the uh, orders are converted into PO, they're drafted for a campus buyer or they're finalized to go direct to vendor. And then the system will dispatch the order. And it's usually done electronically by fax or electronic data transfer. So if you get really wrapped up about the address that they chose to transfer over with the vendor, the, the new cleanup vendor file, you certainly should tell purchasing if, if you think it's wrong. But I wouldn't worry too much about the PO not getting to them because we're doing that electronically. The goods are received. When the goods are received, it may be by the person who has got BFS access to do receiving. It may not be. So I did two steps here in the schematic. So you can see here, here the goods are received. So if this person got them, they're going to tell the receiver to record it. Or if they happen to be the person, this is where it happens. They're going to record receipt in BFS. Now, let me talk about receipt for a minute. In the old system, Voucher approval was the way you release payments. And if you never approved the voucher, the check never went. In this system, once you have the purchase order, and once you have the receipt and the invoice, payment is going to occur with no human interaction. So think of it this way. You've created the order. The vendor typically submits the invoice. So when the invoice is created into a voucher is when it starts searching for the match. If you never load that receiving record, payment will never match and be released. Sometimes that will serve you. If you receive something that you're not sure you're happy with, electron microscope, very expensive. If you receive, the payment could go before you even plug it in and test it. So remember when we told you in standard rec class, you have the opportunity when you create your standard requisition and in EPRO requisition to mark something for inspection, which is a second receiving action. So if you've had the foresight to do that, then you can do the receiving record as soon as it arrives. Payment will not go until someone in the lab tells you it's been re received and inspected. Then someone will go in with inspection and confirm inspection, and then the four-way match will release payment. So my, my advice to the campus is if you forgot to have the conversation up front, to do inspection, then know that your best option is to withhold receipt until you get the go-ahead. Okay? And likewise, currently when people have been submitting these after the facts and forgetting to send invoices to disbursements, they're running their failed match report and there's lots of items out there that don't have a receiving record. So the clue there might be we forgot to receive, and if it, you know, or if it doesn't have a voucher, we forgot to send the, the item to purchasing or to, to disbursements. So after a while, this will become more natural for you. But it's important to know that there's many ways these matches can occur. When a product is on a truck coming from Virginia, the invoice will get recorded before you ever receive the product and mark receipt. So it, it, that will show up on your failed match report only because the product hasn't arrived yet. So that's not really a problem. But if the product's arrived and it's blank, someone forgot to do the receiving record. Likewise, if you ordered from Oakland and the product came the next day, you might have done the receiving record, 
while the invoice is in the mail through disbursements. That won't do anything either. But once that invoice is created into a voucher, that triggers the search. It will find the PO and the receipt, match, and it's gone. That's the functionality that's going to allow us to capture discounts because of quick payment. We're not waiting in some queue for someone who may be on jury duty to do a voucher approval, something like that. Okay, so let's move on from receiving. This, after we receive and the invoice creates a voucher, it does the match, performs matching rules. There's a 20% uh, variance that's allowed. So if it's a $200 item, we could pay up to $240 without a problem. Okay, Might be an important $40 for you. So just because something matched doesn't mean you shouldn't question the hit on your ledger if it's more than you thought. Okay, And that could be a vendor error. Resolve match exceptions. This is a shared responsibility. And I've made a, a big effort in the previous forums to, to remind departments that no one's going to put this in a queue or a work list for you. You have to run a BFS, not a BEARS, but a BFS report in the system to do your failed matches. And so when there's a failed match, there is no one path to a solution, as I just described to you. It could be a case where you ordered 10 items, the vendor shipped 12, and you decided you liked all 12, and you received 12. It's not a match because there's only 10 on the purchase order. That fix would require a change order by a buyer to up the purchase order, and then you have a match. Conversely, you ordered 10, they invoiced you 10, and they shipped you 8. So if you, if you receive 8, they're not going to get a partial payment. You have to wait for the other 2. So if you received 8 good ones and 2 were broken, you could also have the option of telling a vendor, well, we're only going to work with the eight. Don't reship the other two. Re-invoice me for eight. And then eight and eight will match. And it'll be under the 10 on the order. You'll have two left over. We'll close the order, no problem. So you see, when you get the failed match report, you really have to, someone has to, analyst has to look at the information and decide where the fix is. It's not always the receiving record. I just want to make sure that you have that point. Okay, going on. So the system pays the vendor according to vendor terms. So remember, when the voucher is, when the invoice is vouchered, it goes immediately to posting and to the ledger. Okay? So if it's on the 15th day of an invoice that had 30 day net zero terms, the check won't go out of our bank till that 30th day to pay on time, but to, to, to have the benefit of our cash management. So this is different. In the past, everything we paid was late. We never got discounts and vendors weren't happy with how late our payments came. So we're flipping the coin now and trying to get better use of our cash management. But just so you understand that just because it hit your ledger, if a vendor calls, you might say, well, you have to wait to 10 days before you call me just to make sure it's not in the mail already and don't do research. Just sometimes it's good not to jump on these calls right away saying, I can see this process. If you wait 10 days, let's see if the check arrives, then you call me and we'll track it. Because it could be in that timing queue for paying by terms, okay? And you don't have to wrap yourself up about what the terms are. Just know that's the process. And there could be a little gap, maybe five to 10 days, okay, when there's a difference between the voucher date and the actual check date. Then, of course, it posts your ledger, and someone gets to research and review your ledger. Now I'm going to show you the bear buy catalogs and the shopping carts. After completing ePro training, Department staff will access bear buy catalogs via the finance link on blue.berkeley. So over here is the finance link. And we have about nine vendors going live instead of the 12, 15 planned. There's lots involved in getting these vendors into our hosted database, lots of data exchanges and testing. So we wanted more. But certainly by the end of the year, there'll be 35 to 50. In fact, Office Max just got added this week, which I'm very happy about because that's something everyone can buy. So it's finally out there for you to use. So you can see on the Finance tab, Bear Buy SideQuest is the link that your people would use to shop. The requisition creators in this room do not use Blue to go shopping. It would let you, but what you have to be careful of is if you were to go through Blue, and you have a requisition creator identity in the system, it's going to trigger a double identity for you. So as rec creators who might be shopping, you're going to do that from within your requisition, and we're going to show you how to do that. 
So just remember that this is where I said, if you want everyone in your department to go shopping, fine. But if you don't, know that this link is going to be out in there blue, and they have access to it. So it's a matter of departments putting some parameters about how they want shopping to occur. Department staff shop the catalogs and create a cart, like you do on most web shopping sites. You'll notify staff as to the appropriate requisition creator for their carts. For example, if you have a staff of 100 and there's only one requisition creator, there's only one person on them to assign it to. But if you have three different labs and three rec creators, each lab could be assigned one rec creator as a way of managing workloads rather than having it all fall or be a free-for-all and see who grabs what. Carts include an optional description field to identify the purpose of the pur purchase, and it also allows you some differentiation. There's two things that you can do with a shopping cart. You can label it, and you can add this description. If you don't label it, you're going to get a numeric value of 2010-07-020, or, or 20, dash, and then the sequence number, well, if you look at a list of 20 of those, I don't tell you a lot, <laughs> okay? So I'm recommending that people, when, they, when they're assigning carts, that you could actually teach people to name the cart and add a description. So the cart name could be Professor Adams, because maybe you're going to do more than one cart for Professor Adams, and the description on the first one could be lab supplies. The description on the second one might be computers. So that when you're looking at your carts to create your requisitions, you can see those titles and definitions to choose which one you want to work on. And even better, if you have a large group and someone goes shopping and it's a rush, they could put rush in the first four characters of that title. So when you're looking at your list, that's something I want to look at. So when you come to class, be prepared for a discussion on naming your carts, uh, teaching your people to name the carts and assigning them to you, as well as putting in some description about what you're buying, pliers, wrenches, rulers, whatever, lab, lab supplies, whatever. Also, carts include internal notes for the record in more than one place. So you can put a note on the item, you can put a note on the cart, but when you assign the cart, when, when your shoppers assign the cart to a rec creator, they also can put a note, and I'm going to show you a slide with what it looks like. That note is a perfect place for them to put what flex code or what chart string they want you to charge the order to. Because that particular note is triggered in an email to the rec creator telling them there's a shopping cart been assigned to them, and here's the note. So it's a really good, good, good thing to learn how to use in terms of notes to your rec creators. Okay. Shoppers must designate a rec creator in order to save, a sh save the cart and proceed, so they definitely have to have a communication of who they are. They shine, uh, this is a little repetitive, the shoppers assign the shopping carts to your specific rec creator. The rec creator can also reassign the cart. So if I'm, a, if I'm a team of requisition creators, say there's three of us, and they're all coming to me, and I've also got a conference to run or some other activity that I can't get to them right away, but I know my two colleagues can take off the offload for me. As a rec creator, you're going to see this on the screen in a minute, where I can actually take my draft cards that I've collected and assign them to other rec creators. And if I come back from my conference or from my jury do or whatever, and they're not done yet, I can unassign them. But it gives you control over your cards. They're not just stuck in your queue. Okay. So here's what the, 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 the sign lo looks like. This one was assigned to Christine Sign. She's on the development team. And here's that note field. So here she says, Christine, please call me. Should you have questions, here's my phone number. But this is also where you might want to put chart string information for rec creators. Sometimes the, the, that identity isn't in the mind of the rec creator. It's in the person requesting the service. So it's a great place to give a note to someone about how you want this process and to what count string you want it to go to. Two types of catalogs are in SideQuest. Hosted vendors. This is a UC Berkeley online version of selected products that they have given us favorable pricing for. Okay? So it's like we took part of their catalog and put it on our mainframe. Punch out vendors. Punch out to me means we're punching out of our security 
around this campus in terms of computer security and going to that vendor's website like uh, Hewlett Packard and shopping in there. It may be a UC Berkeley specific catalog they provided, but it's on their mainframe. Okay? That's the only difference. So when you, when you, the only thing that's happening here is later, I'm going to show you, when you search for pliers, it's going to look at all the hosted vendors because those catalogs are in our computer. But when you search on pliers, it can't, it can't search the punch out vendors because that would be leaving our mainframe and going somewhere else and bringing it back. So you can shop one at a time that way, but you can't do this, the search business. Okay. That's the big difference. They're both catalogs for us to use. Some resident with us, so we call them hosted. The ones that are outside our world are called punch out. So as, let's translate that to suppliers. We have catalog suppliers or catalog vendors who are both hosted or punch out. And in addition, you have other non-catalog, what we call special request orders from vendors. This third one here equates to what you do today. Every requisition you create today is a special request requisition to a vendor of your selection. Nothing to do with the catalogs. So this is how we do business now. And you'll probably do a lot of business here still until there's more catalogs that are going to serve you in terms of what they sell. So there's actually two types of vendors in the catalogs, and then you have any non-catalog activity is this activity. So here's what the catalog page display looks like. If you were to go out onto blue, or if you punch out, from, or you move out, navigate from BFS requisition page to the catalog page, this is where you go. So in a sense, to get here as a requisition creator, you're actually going to go to a special page in your requisition, click on a link, and it's going to jump into this database. And whatever you do in this database, then you will pull back into BFS as a rec creator. And if someone in your department went shopping here, they're going to mark a shopping cart for you. Uh, let's see, active carts, my orders. You'll see carts in a minute. And you're going to go capture that cart and bring it into BFS. It's the only difference. So up top here is where you can search for everything. So remember, if you put pliers or wrenches here, it's going to search hosted suppliers. If you know one of these suppliers has those two, I would click on one of these and go searching specifically on their site for it and do a comparison by the one you want. But what's really cool about hosted suppliers is that you can do pliers. It'll bring up pliers from five different vendors, and you can do a compare feature just like you can do on Amazon.com. The thing to remember, too, is as we grow, initially, you'll see most of the icons right here. Hosted, punch out. But once we have 150, there's no way you're going to see all the icons here. So just know that this is a way of highlighting, but it's not everyone that's out there. However, you can see up here there's a suppliers link. So today, I, I clicked on that. I saw a list of nine suppliers, and it currently equates to the, to the pictures you see. But there's more than one way to find your suppliers when you actually get into the catalogs. Um, the other thing is over here on the left, action items. This is order status. So if you were creating an order yourself, a catalog yourself, it would accumulate there. And also down here, you will see alerts in this box. It's kind of like a message box. So if they add a new supplier, they might draw your attention to it there the day you, you come onto this page. Or if there's some change in the process, they'll tell you an update here. So this is a good feature as well. The supplier icon view is subject to change. So every time you log in, it might change. Don't let that freak you out. It's just that this is a sampling of what's there, which is why if there's 150 catalogs here, you can see why the search feature would be useful. You don't know which, which of 150 vendors sell that category of product. And when you get really good at this, you can look at, if you drop down this menu, it can say, look at, at a, a category group or a specific product or everything, you know, or by vendor. So there's lots of functionality that we're not going to overburden with you at, at, at the beginning. We want you to start slow, and I'll mention this a few times today to keep things simple, because this is where it gets more involved. Now, the cart types, there's a draft cart, which is created by shoppers waiting for processing. There's an active cart, which has been imported into BFS by you, and you're working on a requisition. And then my recent carts are the ones that you processed already and taken care of as a requisition. So here's what the shopping cart page looks like. You can see on the left, it says active carts. This page is draft carts. 
and then there's my recent cards. So here you see drafts, my drafts, and you see my drafts assigned to others. Over here is the shopping cart name. So look at this. One, two, three. They all look the same because they're numerical labels. Not very intuitive for you. Not very useful. So when someone is creating a shopping cart, especially a staff member who's sending it to you, it would be great if you came up with a naming convention that would work for you. Okay? Whether it's department head, lab name, whatever. And then there's also a description field that comes with the cart where you can say what's in the cart. Okay? So remember I said if you assign these cards to somebody else because you're busy, you would come here and you would unassign it back to yourself. So it gives you control of your cards. And again, you're going to go through all of this in the keyboard training. I'm merely exposing you to, to familiarize yourself with the layout so when you see it a second time, your dendrites are connecting a little more. Okay? <clears throat> So as I said, best practice, provide intuitive naming here, and people have a better shot of providing you, them, uh, you have a better shot of providing them with good service. Shopping cart message. There are two messages that come with a shopping cart. Both the requisition creator and the shopper receive an email notification, and here's when it happens. The rec creator, most of you in the room, will receive an email when the shopper assigns a shopping cart to you and saves it. So you're going to get an email alert saying, you know, maybe you don't have a lot of activity. You're not going to go in there looking every day. So email will let you know there's a cart waiting to be made into a requisition. And it gives you the information you need to go get it. When you capture that cart and bring it back into BFS, the shopper, <laughs> our shopper here, will get an email themselves saying, Jane Adams has picked up your cart and is processing it. So everyone's in the know of what's happening with the shopping cart once it's been saved. Here's a sample of what the email looks like. You can see up here on the upper left, it says a shopping cart has been assigned to you, and this, this one went to uh, Gina Grossi on the development team. And here's the message that was included in the message box. So you kind of have to pick it out, because it's not going to be highlighted this when you get a black and white text. But essentially, in this, this text you know, get, tells you who to contact and bear by support should you be having a problem, stuff like that. But this is what the email will go to the requisition creator saying, hello, there's a shopping cart to pick up. Right. So let me give you kind of a perspective on this. Bear by carts are assigned to requisition creators. So there could be several carts out there. Each cart could contain a single item which is the simplest low-value transaction known to man. Multiple items. But here's the big kick about version 9, even in your standard rec. It can be to a single vendor or to multiple vendors. So this is one of the big changes from last year, where remember in your requisition and PO headers, it was the vendor identity at the top? Well, you won't find that in the, the version 9, because the vendor identity is at the line level. Now, to start your work slowly, I have recommended people start with one vendor on a requisition. So you can put that on the default and it'll copy to every line. But just so you know why that functionality is there is because of the shopping cart catalogs. Because if your shopper searches for office supplies and goes through those supplies picking the things they want and saves their cart, the cart may in fact hold 10 items from three vendors. And that's OK. okay. If you were to build a requisition yourself, like you do now, you could conceivably add a row and choose a different vendor. But I'm recommending do not. Put the vendor on the default page. Keep it a single vendor, like you did all your low value, and keep it clean for now. You're going to get into enough complexity when you're really good on the system. But don't overcomplicate your work now. But I just need to explain to you why the vendor unit of measure and, and, and um, a category code are at the line level, because they can be very unique to each line. So after you've captured a cart into a requisition, the requisition could have line items and one or more vendors. And when you process that requisition into an order, it actually would produce automatically four orders, one for each vendor. So you'll see when you go to e-procurement keyboard training, there's a way of looking up a requisition, and it'll show you one or maybe more POs from that requisition. So, it's, it's, so see, that's where the complexity is in. 
in this system. Other than that, the data that you work with, the processes you do pretty much haven't changed that much, except when we redirect you to direct voucher stuff. Okay? But it's about getting used to the structure of these pages, and that's what I'm going to go on to now. Standard requisition transition to e-procurement. Here's the standard requisition page. And as I told people in the standard rec class, to do a low value in the regular version 9 requisition, you would just do defaults on the requisition defaults page and the line detail here, and you've got your low value order. Two things you have to do besides that, besides line and requisitions, you also have to identify your requester. We had some tickets come to the help desk. They couldn't send the requisition to approval. Well, they had just skipped right past this field. That's all that was required. Remember, requester drives the approval of both the standard rec and the EPRO rec. And you are usually the requester on your own requisitions. Basically, what we did is we made every rec creator the requester rather than having potentially 500 people there for you to request. You know, the, the, the person who made the request, we're using the, you as the key player here. So when you pick yourself as the requester, you'll find yourself listed one or more times depending on how your department has set up your security. And you may remember this from the previous presentation. I'm just trying to review this for you. So if I was assigned three different org nodes at level five of the org tree to submit work for, each of those nodes might have a different approver. So when I'm looking for my name in the request list, I look for my name dash and the org node level for whom I'm doing this requisition. And that way the approval goes to the right place. Okay. So the standard rec and EPRO page comparison, here's the version 9 EPRO requisition. There's a defined rec requisition page, an add items, line items page, and the review and finalize chart string page when you submit. So we're going from potentially two pages in the standard rec to three in the EPRO rec. Okay? So it's a little structured a little differently, and I'll take getting used to. Notice that the line defaults page expands to your chart string information. So when you first uh, look at this page, it looks pretty benign, but the line defaults are here. So remember when we talk about defining a requisition, it's your business unit and your requester. And then if you want to name the requisition, you can. But most importantly, when you look at line defaults, what would you, uh, well, rather than ask you a question, let me just define it. Think of a default page as a copy down feature. How many of you do financial journals? OK, so you know how in financial journals you can mark the fields of a chart string to copy down? Well, when we're talking about defaults on a requisition, you're talking about filling in a field that can be used multiple times somewhere else on each line. So when you choose a vendor on the line detail in the default, every line you have will, will default to that vendor. All right? And, and likewise, ship to. If it's always going the same place, you can change ship to at the line level, but use these defaults. So my, my recommendation to you is use the default page to your advantage. If it's a one-line order, like a low-value order that's pretty simple, fill this out to the max. And when you get to the third page for review and submit, there's very little for you to change and modify. The where, where I give people caution in the standard rec class is category code and unit of measure. If you're going to order, and efficiency would expect that you would order more than one thing at a time, why do a requisition for one item every time? It's a lot of work, especially in EPRO. So start bundling your orders in office supply groups or whatever, OK? So why would I put category code and unit of measure on the default page if each of the four lines I'm going to have are different? Because if it defaults, I'm going to skip right over it because it's there and never change it to the right unit of measure or commodity code or whatever. So I would recommend leaving these blank, maybe even on a one-page order, and making sure that you fill it in on the line when you review the chart string and finalize the chart string. That way, you're always going to select the most appropriate thing for the line item being purchased. And the default won't override it because you put it at the default page and you forgot to change it. Okay. Now, the other thing you'll notice is that this chart string is also a copy down. So it doesn't have the plus to add another row for a split distribution like you're used to doing, because you do that on page three. This is your copy from page. 
So if you put nothing here, you get to page three, you get to fill in your full chart string. If you use this, you would use the part of the chart string that is replicated on every line and fill in the others. Okay, just the way I always has worked. Now, how many of you do purchases for uh, Office of the President and Business Unit J1000? Okay, it's very different from last year in that we would tell you last year to change the business unit to J1000 to do your work. We work at Berkeley, which is business unit 10,000. So you would leave 10,000 on the header of your requisition, but at the distribution line, you would change this to J in four zeros. So that when this distribution line is processed, it goes to the J ledger. Okay, so that's a big change for you, you people who buy J stuff. Okay, and if you want to talk to me offline, we can review this. And I actually have a schematic I did in my office I could send you. Okay. So now I want to go over the requisition page by page. Now I say here purchases are, uh, for departments are made in two ways, but in reality expenditures are done three ways. You have direct voucher, you have blue card, and you have requisitions. But since this is the purchasing side of the conversation, I'm saying two because it's blue card and purchase requisitions. We require a requisition for all purchases. Now, they made an exception when we did the initial implementation, which is why you used to be able to be in control of your low value orders. They did some kind of division of the database and somehow gave you access to do low value orders that didn't muck up the integration. But as we moved forward to this system, it became clear they couldn't keep doing that. So one of the ch cultural change things that's hard for some of us, especially that like to control things like me, is that I used to get that little purchase order in my grimy little hands. <laughs> and I would send it. And I knew it got there. I messengered it or I faxed it. And now we're asking you to do the requisition, get it approved, and wait peacefully for it to happen. So I just want to testify you on a couple things. One, one of the problems we had in the old system was there were so many vendors that were duplicated. And they had bad addresses. Well, at UCSF, when we implemented, we did it centrally. And when it came over here, I was aghast when I heard they were distributing that because I knew what was going to happen. So now they have cleaned up the vendor file and made a single vendor identity with a single address. There may be some mistakes about which address they chose for this cleanup. So you certainly should send an email to Perch Help and let them know when you find those. But remember, and I said this earlier, is that your, your order is most likely going to go by fax or by electronic transfer. So even if the address has got a little mistake in it, it's probably not the way the order is going to be delivered. So, and also so you know, some vendors that we're linked to, especially through the catalog, will actually send you an email saying your order's been received. But it's just not all of them, so we can't tell you to expect it. So that said, it's about trusting the new system and giving us the feedback, as many are, <laughs> when it's not working right, but it's being fixed. But implementations always run like this. And considering the, the limited resource we have, we have five trainer help people. And I've trained 2,500 people since May. And we're doing classes. And we're writing the UPKs, User Producti Productivity Kits, which is your players, quick reference guides, answering the tickets on the help desk. I mean, so you don't be surprised if you don't see answers come on Sunday or Saturday because everyone's running to the finish line. But I think we've done remarkably well considering, but it's certainly on all levels, not just training and communication, but project, running to the finish line, getting the rest of the things fixed. It's a, it's a process we always go through, just like we did 10 years ago. This one's not so bad, but still we're running into some crap that they're fixing. So, which is why I want you all in the BFS listserv so you can be told what's being fixed and changed. They're even talking about changing some of the procedural stuff, so you definitely want to stay tuned in. So, to repeat, every purchase now begins with a requisition. And direct to vendor is the term we will use for low value. And by that we mean you create a requisition, the requisition gets approved, becomes a purchase order, and gets dispatched directly to the vendor without purchasing his involvement. Okay. Do not confuse direct to vendor, unfortunately, with direct voucher, which is a check request process. Okay. And your procurement card orders are outside of BFS, and that's still an avenue for you, so don't worry about that. You cannot go to the catalog and use your 
blue card, though. It's, you have to do a requisition for catalogs. Category codes. This is, as I said earlier, been a, a, a stumbling block for people because they're trying to be too precise. So there's a couple things to know about it. When a category code is selected, when you're doing a non-catalog requisition, which is like what you're doing today, category code brings with it an expense account that has been mapped up to it based on the nature of the category and the specific expense that they think represents that. So depending on the category code, you end up picking because there's not a lot that you can relate to and you finally pick one. And that's all you got to do. There's no consequence to you, the user in the department. Category codes are used by purchasing to get better pricing for the commodities that we buy. And in the past, all they got was miscellaneous. It gave them no sense of what the split was. So this will help them going forward with their strategic procurements. So you don't have to get too wired about, oh my god, this order is going to get totally screwed up if I choose the wrong category code. Not the case. You just want to choose the best one. So like when I had rent and I went uh, scanning down the printed copy, which is my recommendation starting is doing it that way, I found uh, real estate services. Bingo. So that maps to an expense account that shows up on your chart stream. Just remember, you don't have to accept it. You can override it. So if your department has chosen to manage its expenditures at specific expense account levels, and you do a category code and it brings over one you don't like, do a search and put the one in you want. You can do that. But more importantly, when you finally get to the catalogs and the shopping cart, all the products in the catalogs, you can see the work in developing these catalogs, all the products in the catalogs are already mapped to a category code. You will not have to search for it. One reason to go to the catalogs, you can get out of that problem. <laughs> but you don't have to search for it. It comes with the cart, so you get the product, you get the category code, and you get the expense account that was mapped to it. Bottom line, you can always change the expense account at the line level to something you prefer better. <clears throat> this is the URL where you can look for an updated category list. If you hear that one's been updated, that's where you would go. That's where I went to get this one. But they'll put a better matrix up there with the additional information that I've requested. Attachments. Now, now that you've been in the system a while, you probably know this already, but you can attach documents to the requisition and submit to purchasing. So if you're working with a buyer on an expensive item and there's some kind of drafting image or some picture in a magazine that you want him to go find and resource and source for you, you could do that. So there is a, everywhere there's a comment field capability, and I'll show you those icons, uh, you can open that and put a comment and mark it for the vendor or not. So it could be just a comment that you want in the record that this was given to me last minute, and I've, I've expedited this, and this is the data that's been processed. Some CYS stuff sometimes. Or you can hit the attachment button and scan in something and attach it to the requisition, like a schematic or something that you want them to send to the vendor. And there'll be a checkbox sent to the vendor. Okay. So everyone should have at least access to a scanner, if not have one. The other thing to know is that once you start working with the catalogs, some of that won't work. You can't necessarily do any attachment for a vendor in a catalog. You're going to their catalog and selecting stuff. So this is mostly about the non-catalog requisitions that you're creating. It's a good feature. And my other helpful hint is that set up a, you know how you can put a folder on your desktop? What I do for my scanner is I put a folder out in the desktop that says parking spot, scan parking spot. So everything you scan goes to one location, and you're not driving all over your desk when you're trying to attach something, going, where the hell did I put that? You know? And you go looking for it. So if you make it easy for yourself, it's parked in one spot, and you go pick from it. Once you've picked it, you can delete it so it's not still there if you don't want it there, or you can move it to where you want to keep it. Requisitions are used for low-value purchases, which are direct-to-vendor, and that's under $5,000, including tax that you can anticipate. But since freight can't be predicted, it's not part of the dollar value. It'll be dispatched directly to the vendor without a buyer involvement. High value purchases of goods or services would go to your partner buyer. So every department knows who their buyer is in central purchasing or the delegated buyers out in the campus that have been delegated to do so by purchasing. That's your partner. So when you do a requisition and name the buyer, instead of direct to vendor, you name the buyer. that order is going to be drafted into an order, and that buyer is going to pick it up and finish it. Or if you uh, 
create one for uh, special handling. It'll go to a buyer to do the special handling. And then they're dispatched to the vendor. There's also, and this is not new, there's a, a procurement website for restricted items. So if you ever think you're in the restricted items, you know, like radioisotopes and radioactive stuff, you can go out, go out there and find out what your limitations are. Just, that's just a friendly reminder. Now, purchasing e-procurement. When we went live July 7th, everyone went live into version 9. So the initial access was standard requisition, which is similar to 8.8 requisitions, but changed to mostly field arrangement, some labels, and some navigation. Now you, as a team, your department, is migrating to e-procurement, which will now include the bare by catalog database integration, which is online catalog shopping, shopping carts, compare features where you can compare pricing between vendors on a specific product and then select the one you want to, want to purchase. The catalogs contain favorable UC pricing, so there's a natural draw to want to go there. Right now, it's even hard to find out where all our agreements are. It's, a, it's almost hard to find on the web where the list is. And then you have to call the vendor and have asked for UC pricing and give them your blue card, that kind of stuff. So this will make it easier from that perspective. But with the process involved, including receiving, you want to group your orders into larger volumes so you're not doing so many individual orders. And this is a phase rollout that will last at least until December. So we'll be doing this presentation at least live or recorded once a week. And there'll be at least two to three keyboard classes a week, depending on the volume of users. We're destined to train 100 users a week all the way through to December. So you create a requisition in two ways. You're going to create a non-catalog special request requisition for a non-catalog supplier. That's what you do today. Every day when you create a requisition for a low-value purchase, you're identifying the vendor, putting in the price and the item that you want. You've already done your research off, offline, and you go forward. Okay? So that's the same thing you're doing now. It's just we're calling it a special request requisition. And you'll see why when I show you the screen. Or you can, you can create a bare buy catalog requisition, but it's done in two ways. The first way is you create your own bare buy shopping cart from your requisition page. So in that circumstance, the department said, Rec Creator, we want you to do the catalog shopping. We'll tell you what we want, and you'll start a requisition, and you'll go to the catalog, grab the stuff, and bring it into your requisition. Okay? And then, for those departments that want other people to do shopping, those people can also create a shopping cart who assigned it to you. So just because they cre create a cart doesn't mean it comes to you, but they have to assign it to you. So either it's created by you or it's assigned to you. And those are the two catalog approaches. Catalog searching from the requisition page. You're going to review the current vendor list. I actually gave you one that's the whole list. But if you go to the shopping page, the catalog page where I said supplier, you'll see the list that's there. Those are the ones that you know you can shop at. Then you have a reason to go to the catalog. So basically, see what sources are there first. Get familiar with so you don't waste your time searching for something that's not there. Once there's 150 catalogs, I'd, first place I'd go. Catalog, do a search on product and see what I get. But you're, you're a little early in the game for that. So the list of catalogs available in your handout, but it'll be updated. And certainly, the page will be updated. And they'll be posted as new suppliers are added. And there's a lot of work in terms of exchanging data and setting up the catalogs. You want to search a vendor in the catalog and create your own shopping cart for importing multiple items into your requisition. Or you can search all the hosted catalogs for a product. So the options are yours. As with now, when you designate buyer on your requisition, that determines approval processing or processing of the rec to an order. So a campus buyer selection means that I need a campus buyer, my partner in procurement, to take this order to the next level, either sourcing it, getting me pricing, or whatever. Okay? Or it's over $5,000, even though you know what you want and which vendor, you need the buyer. After the fact, these orders are processed but not sent to a vendor because you've already got your product or your service. So it's really making the order a record that then can be matched with your receipt and your invoice so we can pay it. So you're just following up on stuff to get it in the system. Direct-to-vendor is a low-value order that once it's approved, 
as a requisition will go straight to dispatch and off to the vendor within a day. Special handling. If you create an order and you're concerned about the, um, the vendor address, you could say special handling and in the comments link on the header, provide the address that you want to make sure this order goes to. This only happens probably in the middle range vendors. If you have huge vendors like Dell or Hewlett Packard, they want all their orders going to one address in one location. And then they decide which distribution point it comes out of. Small vendors, hardware store here in Berkeley, you don't have to worry about multiple addresses, there's only one. Middle vendors could actually have subsidiaries broken up around the country that truly take their own orders. So if we've, in cleaning up the vendor file, brought the wrong address over and you want your order going to the, that vendor but in Chicago, then you would say special handling and put the note in to the buyer who's going to review this, that you want to make sure this order gets to this division or whatever. So just think of special handling is, rather than trust the system, if you have any concerns, you can create a special handling, create a note, and someone's going to confirm it before it's released into an order. And you can always ask for address corrections, updates, and things like that from purchasing. Subawards, we only create orders for subawards when it's involving Berkeley writing money to the subaward. If we're on someone else's subaward, they're sending us money, so you don't have one. So it's only if money's involved do you create an order for a subaward, and that's so we can write payments out to other locations. So here's what the buyer field looks like. When you click on the buyer field on a requisition page, you get a list of the buyers, which are your individual buyers who are usually partnered up with the department. And then here are those special categories. After the fact, direct to vendor, special handling, subaward. Paul Mulligan gets all of those in terms of his umbrella of responsibilities. Now remember, now that you're in the requisition world, once the order's created, you can't really modify the order anymore. When you could low value, you could always open up a low value order and do something with it. Now you can't do that. So whether it's any of these, know that you would have to contact your buyer or Paul Mulligan if it was a correction to direct to vendor. Say you issued a direct to vendor uh, order that got dispatched, and then you decide you changed your mind. Okay? You would have to contact Paul Mulligan and say, cancel the order, because when you cancel an order, we have to notify the vendor, because the vendor's already received the order. Okay? So these are the people you would contact when you need change orders or some, some way to intercede on an order for you. Ship to and location codes. Ship to and location codes have been loaded for all Berkeley locations, Richmond Field Station, the campus, etc. In the past, ship to was a smaller subset of the entire list. Okay. So now that we want you in the requisition set for even your low value stuff, we've now made location, which is at the line level, and ship to the same list. Okay? And I want to show you how that might work. If I was shipping a low value to Payroll at University Hall, final destination, that's the one I would pick for ship to. And my location code at the line level, by the way, will, will default to my requisition creator location. So it's linked to your profile. Okay? So there's no reason to change it. And if someone's looking at the line, they know who to call by that identity at your location. They can find you. However, if you had a large item being shipped and it was going to central receiving, you might have to put ship to central loading dock, and then it's going somewhere else. So then you would go down to the line level and change the location code of the line level to the final delivery point. So both were on the requisition for easy reference. So when central receiving gets it and forwards it to you, they can look at the line level and know where to forward it. You can always put comments in as well. If it's going central, don't be afraid to use comments. Either way, you're going to give them information where this product needs to go. If you do not find a ship to location for a unique address, like it's, it's a, um, a grant that you put off in Fresno or something, they will add it, so just so you know. And what's important about that is ship to determines sales tax. When I worked at UC San Francisco, it was problematic because everything got shipped to the loading dock at our procurement office down by the airport, which happened to be in a different county. So we went through sales tax, use tax, nice nightmares. Here, almost everything is Alameda County. But should you ship to another county, that will drive the sales tax that's put on the order. It's not put on the requisition, but on the order. And that's how they relate it to the invoice when it comes in. 
Also, you know that no tax is still a ship to option. So if you have something like entertainment that shouldn't be taxed, you would choose ship to no tax and then put the shipping address in the common field for delivery. Requisition approval. Once you've submitted your requisition for approval, the approval routing is determined, as I said earlier, by your requester identity, the requester that you've defined on the requisition. Now here's a little caveat. 90% of the time, if not 99% of the time, it will be you. But should you offer to do a requisition for some, someone in your area, another unit that is on jury duty and they need to get an order done, you're going to do a requisition but when you select requester, you'll select that person so that the approval goes to their approver, not yours. Okay? So that would be the one exception where you're not choosing yourself. So BFS then sends the approval request to approvers in their work list. So they get a work list of recs to approve and vouchers to approve, typically if they've got both roles. Okay. Canceling a cart or a requisition. A shopper can delete a cart out on SideQuest, bare by, before it's picked up by you, the requisition creator. Now you, the requisition creator, can cancel a requisition before it's approved. Okay? But once it's approved, it's almost immediately going into purchase order status, so that would be the marker. I mean, there might be chances where you could cancel it after approval, but because the system's raking for these approvals several times a day, we just chose to say prior to approval. Also a helpful hint, if you want to print a requisition, do it before you submit approval because there's been a, a technical problem with printing it afterwards. Not that I want you to print requisitions, you really shouldn't have to. Using the PO number on stuff is all you really need to do and it links to everything. So if you want to cancel a bear buy vendor, you cancel the requisition and you can leave the shopping cart in the database. So either the shopper canceled the cart or you can just not process the cart or you can start your requisition, then cancel it and leave the cart in your history. Why? When you and I go shopping, in fact, this is the way I satisfy my shopping needs. I go shopping online all the time, buy lots of great stuff, but never complete the transaction. Leave the shopping cart full and log out, go on my merry way. Think I'll get back to that, I'll buy it next week. Those carts stay there until those vendors rake the database of all these dead carts. Okay? Same thing here, there's no reason to chase our tail empty these carts when we could let them just go into history. They're not going to do anything. Same thing, non bear buy vendor. If you do a requisition for a non bear buy vendor, they don't have an order yet. So unless you've called them and baited them with one, <laughs> they're not doing anything. So you just cancel the requisition. And there's no shopping cart associated with that. It's the same stuff you do today. But remember, anytime an order has been issued, we have an obligation to tell the vendor the order's canceled. Otherwise, you can get a shipment. All right, now let's talk about changes between standard rec and EPRO rec. The page arrangement is totally different, as I already previewed to you. So I'm going to want you to explore the UPK topics to become more familiar with the pages and the processes of those topics that are related to the work you do. So if you don't do receiving, don't play a receiving UPK. UPK, User Productivity Kit. It's a name PeopleSoft gave it. I wouldn't have called it that, but that's what we're working with. If I were king, you're going to select the requester to begin your requisition. And then with requisition creating, you're going to go to the catalog supplier and build the requisition from a shopping cart. Shopping carts are built by you, the requisition creator, on the web tab. And I'm going to show you that in a minute. That's how you get to the catalogs. For a non-catalog supplier, you're going to prepare a special request requisition. So just think, non-catalog, special request. So here's the new menu functionality. You're familiar with the menu up here. That's what they always look like. But now on the bottom, you see this little square that says requisition summary. As you build your shopping cart with stuff, this updates. Almost any catalog you go to online does that for you. It's up in the corner. This is what's in your cart. So you can essentially track this to make sure you don't go over the $5,000 or anywhere near it. Because the system will let you build an $8,000 direct-to-vendor order. It won't block you, but in a sense, you're committing a violation of the authority to go $4,999 and under. Okay? So this is helpful. Now, the one negative, I don't know how that happened. Hang on. 
The one negative is if you know how we tell you to have a full screen, you can get rid of the menu. But when you do that, that goes away too. So you can always open it to check it and close it again if you want full screen, which I always recommend. The new functionality, shopping cart requisitions can have multiple vendors. I can't repeat that enough because I need to get you used to that concept. Each requisition line item is now vendor specific. You can provide an additional second approval. Some departments have assigned second approvers. So if you're a department that did that, when you do your approval and the approval window comes up, there's a plus. You can plus and assign the second approver. Say it's the PI, the principal investigator wants to approve everything. You can do that. Most people are not using that feature. I just want you to know there is such a feature, and we can always aspire to it later. But if you do a second approver, they are sequential. So the first one would have to go first before they get it. Now, here's some icons you're going to see on several pages. This first one, this icon appears in two places. It'll appear at the vendor level, so it's who are you buying from. And this icon will also appear on the line level, what are you buying? Click on that, it's going to give more definitive information. Another icon that you've seen before is the comment field. On the header of the requisition is a link for comments. Not a picture like that, but a link. That would be where you want to send a message about the whole order to the buyer or to the vendor. The comment button will appear at the line level. So when you click on that, you also have the option of creating a note at the line level and attach something at the line level. It works the same in all places. This one with the arrow separating two calendars is view expanded. In other words, if it's next to something, you can enlarge what you're looking at. And lastly, this is a new one that we haven't seen much of. It's a little triangle. It can be face down or to the right. And when it's there, you click on it. It's either going to expand something to the right or like I did on that first page for defaults. When I hit the arrow down, it opened up all the defaults. All right, now ready to go to the requisition? Let's do it. Here's the menu on the right. You've been functioning in the purchasing menu, and now you're going to function in the e-procurement menu. So there's some very minor changes that are going to occur. When you function in this first menu, you went to purchasing, create requisition. Once you're approved for e-procurement, that line item will go away. You will not do any standard recs anymore. Yours will all be done down here in e-procurement, create requisition. Okay? However, that doesn't mean you won't be going up here because you can go up to the purchasing menu to do receiving by PO number. So someone in your department who is in the ePro department who has to do receiving will still go to purchasing slash receipts to do receiving when you have the PO number. And believe me, that's the best way to do it. Pack and Slip will have a receiving number on it. It makes it nice and easy. There are other methods that you can use in e-procurement if you're the rec creator to find the purchase order. Uh, or someone can cross-reference it. There's lots of things you can do. When you come into training, we're actually going to show you the receive items down here as well. The difference between receiving here and purchasing and receiving down here is up here, it's assuming you have the PO number. But say the dog ate the packing slip, someone spilled coffee on it, whatever happened, you don't have it. But someone told you from the lab that it was received. If you are the rec creator, or the requester, and you use that menu, receive items, what it does is it opens up a page and instantly, oh, I shouldn't say instantly because it might be raking the data for a while, depending on how many you have, but it will rake the database for all your, specifically your, open orders with open lines. So it won't show any lines that have been satisfied, it'll just show you everything open for receiving. So say someone called me for the lab who got that electron microscope, and I remember I ordered it from Office Pro. I would go to receiving through ePro because I created that requisition, and I might be the receiver as well. A lot of people are both roles. But because I'm the rec creator, I can do this. I open that menu. It's going to list all my open items and all the vendors. And there's the electron microscope with Office Pro. Great. So I mark that line change to the purchase order tab, it brings that line over to the purchase order tab and lets you receive on it, right there. But again, that's the long way to get to something if you don't have the PO number. Now, a person who's doing receiving only, 
in an EPRO department who did not get identified as a rec creator or the requester cannot use this feature. As they come here, it'll go blank. Okay. They'd go up there by purchase order number. So you just have to do the research to get the PO number. But the one thing the receiver can do is there is a manage requisitions item that does the same thing. But that, will, that page will open up all the open items for the entire campus. And then you would filter it by your org node or by your requester or by your rec creator and just get yours. But it's the long way around the horn. But this functionality is in the UPK and in the classroom. She'll show you some of this. Okay. So you can see the complexity where we want to take it slow, start simple, one vendor per order, and not get too wrapped up with it because it can get kind of involved. So now we're going to talk about the three requisition pages you're going to work with. Define requisition is that first page where those defaults go. You're going to identify the buyer, the vendor, category code, unless it's a one-line item and you want to use the copy down, I wouldn't, but you can. And then speed chart defaults if you want to use speed charts. And then shipping, the schedule, ship to and due date. Then the second page is, I call the meat page, is the add items or services. The goods or services of purchase go on page two. So we kind of started the rec on page one by defining it loosely, adding the items on page two, and then we're going to go to page three to review and submit. And it's more than review because you're going to finalize the chart string. If you only use the defaults for like up through program code and left chart field one and two blank for your program project and flex field codes, then you would come here and insert them at each line appropriate for that line. And also at the line level, if this was something like a blanket order, this is where you would go to the attributes tab and mark it as amount only. So instead of looking for quantity to receive on, it's say a $10,000 12 month order and you get an $800 invoice every month, okay? It's gonna open up to receive by amount only when it's marked this way so that you'll have say $8,500 left on the order to receive on and you'll change that to the $500 on the invoice in front of you. And the next time you come here, it'll say 8,100. It'll have decremented, okay? So that's when amount only is used. And then from there, you're ready. Once you do your review and everything's according to Hoyle, you submit for approval. <clears throat> now let's talk about each individual page. Here's the defined requisition page. There's the defaults. So again, you have speed chart key, which is just a speed chart. It's their label. We have the vendor identity. Most of your vendors will be location one because we cleaned up the file to a single identity. The buyer field, remember that drives how the process will work, whether it goes straight to production of a dispatch or whether it stops to a buyer. This one, direct to vendors, low value, we go straight away. Category unit measure, I left blank here because I prefer you doing them on the line level. When I run the player later in that transaction I'm gonna show you, you're gonna see it filled in at this level. Whatever works. I only caution you, if you do it this level and you do multiple lines, you're going to have to remind yourself to overwrite what's there from the default to the correct item. So blank is better because it's going to draw you to it. Then shipping default, ship to, which is where you would put either no tax or your actual ship to location, the due date, and if you want it sent to someone specific at that ship to location, you can even put their name in there. And then lastly, the accounting defaults on the lower left. And I want to show you something here. You can see here, we have account, alt account we don't use, fund, department, program, class we don't use, budge ref we don't use, product we don't use, affiliate we don't use. So where are chart field one and two? Somewhere over here. So there is a UPK called customizing your chart string that we recommend that you do. Just so you know, each page you go to where there's a chart string, you would do a customization once. So if you were doing a requisition, you would customize it so that we get rid of this and we move chart field one and two right up behind program. They're right there for you to confirm without having to scroll. The next time you use this page, that'll be there for you unless we do some system fix or upgrade. So it's only once unless there's some interruption. Now, if you're the receiver also, and you go and you you've customized your requisition and the receiver goes to open it or even the rec approver goes to open it to approve it 
they also would have, they're going to see the full chart string arrangement original. They would have to customize their pages because it's user specific. Okay? So it's a utility that makes your work easier for you. If you're happy with working with these long fields and having to scroll, you can leave it that way. But it's really easy to do, and you only do it once. Okay, now, the meet page, the add items and services page. When it opens, I want to draw your attention to the fact that there is a catalog tab, and select the catalog here, and search catalog here. Eh, we don't use it. Think of it this way. If Berkeley built their own catalogs, this is where we'd be. But instead, we're using SideQuest, which is a module attached to BFS for the catalogs. So your link is going to be web. So we're going to use the web to go to SideQuest Bearby to get your catalogs. So even if the page opens here, I want you to know there's only two tabs you're going to use. This is where we get into visual noise when I talk about the fact that we're not overly customizing the system to, to protect you from all this visual noise, fields you don't use, tabs you don't use, links you don't use. So now it's important to have the quick reference guide so you know if we're telling you to use a field, use it. But even if the field has an intuitive cue like catalog, don't go there unless we told you to, okay? So in this case, you use web for bear buy, side quest, or special requests for non-catalog orders to do a regular requisition. Those are the only two tabs you're going to use. So let's go to the special requests, because we're not going to do catalog here. I'm showing you a basic requisition, which is, I think, where most people are starting, because we have so few catalogs. So by going to the special request tab, it brings up this section of a page for line items. We do not use the bottom three here. We only use the special item link. So clicking on that link opens up this subpage, ready to add an item. So if there was five items, you're going to fill this page out five times, and not all on the same page. Each one opens. So for example, here, we would fill out this stuff. And at the bottom, you can put a note here. But again, if depending on the vendor, the notes don't always go to the vendor. If it's a re special request vendor, you can put a note here and say, send a vendor. But if it's a catalog, when you're doing catalogs later, don't even use this field. It won't go to them most of the time. But we've got our default Alco supply. So then we would fill it in. And you'll see that when I walk through a transaction in a minute. When I say, say save this, then it says, do you want to add another one? It gives me another blank field to fill in to create multiple lines. You only do it once, you have a one-line requisition. So we've done our lines. So now we're looking at the review and submit page. You'll see here <clears throat> that it's got header information, business unit, and who the requester is. But the vendor is not located here. Why? Because I told you now each line is vendor specific. So it's not on the header anymore. And over here, you see these little check boxes where each line has a check box and an expandable arrow. Over here, you've got line details icon and the comment icon. So this is where you come to add a comment or an attachment for this line. And this is where you come for comment or attachment for this line. And if you want to look at the detail, you click on that icon. But better than that, over on the left, we're going to open up this, and you can see the detail to review it. You got tablet pads at Office Max, six dozen for $5 a piece, $31.50 total. And then here, it's we expect it to deliver July 15th. Should have had a ship to address, quantity of six to the attention of Sylvester, and down here you have your chart string to review. Each line can be open like that. And if you had to, you could change the ship to or the due date before you submit for approval. Remember, shipping to, if you think of the potential of having a different vendor on every line, you could have a different ship to address in every line and a different due date on every line. I wouldn't get too wrapped up with that. Just choose a due date two to three or four weeks out so you know the order can close after you've gotten your goods and not get too wrapped up with that. <clears throat> Do not change your vendor once you get down to the review and submit page. That should happen at the beginning of your, at least at this point, they don't want to trigger anything in the system. Okay, so now we're going to go on a little adventure. I've shown you the navigation and what the pages look like. So now I'm going to walk through creating a requisition for a non-catalog vendor. Okay, so I'm going to navigate over 
to the UPK. So most of you know this already, but you go to the www.bai.berkeley.edu website, which is where you can get uh, this homepage, hang on, right here. And so it's the ESS, our uh, training group website, and under the training heading, you can scroll down, you can see there's several things you want to know about. The manual for e-procurement is not yet posted, but when it is, it'll be a full 500-page manual with screenshots. And more, unless we break it down by topic, it will be too big to deal with. Quick reference guides are by topic. And then user productivity kit is the player for the topics. The one thing I want you to know is that when we record a transaction with 100 screenshots creating the player, one of the processes from that to produce from that the quick reference guide and the manual. So the one thing you can be sure of is they're going to be the same. The only difference is the manual has screenshots, quick reference guide doesn't. So it's like a step sheet. So you would click on U UPK to go to the player or the quick reference guides if you want to go there. And now you're going to see quite a few more than you used to see. 8.8's down here, Bears, the HR system. Up top, there's three UPKs, one for version 9. So that would be reference going forward for a department that's still doing standard requisitions and not yet migrating to e-procurement. The second one is UPK for e-procurement. That's your area. And for those departments who want shoppers to know how to use the catalogs, we've even created e-procurement for shoppers. Now, we didn't mix it in with the BFS users to, to not confuse the whole thing. Because shoppers don't, they, they have a role, but it's not an assigned role. They just have an access role. They, because they have access, they have a role of creating a shopping cart, if you want them to. But you, you can't block them, you just have to educate them, okay? So what I did today is I'll click on UPK for e-procurement. It opens up the player. I don't know why it's doing that. And you'll see I've had help tickets. The buttons don't work, okay? Or I don't have access to UPK. Everyone has access. It's a public posting. But what you need to know is you need to open up down to a topic level before these buttons become activated. So if I click on the topic, see it's activated. And now you can play it. It opens up with what we call a, um, a concept frame where we tell you about the subject, an introduction, usually the scenario that we're going to use. So oftentimes, you'll find stuff here that's pretty informative. If you go to the top level, oftentimes this has a lot more substantial information. I know it did in the standard rec pay section. So we're going to go over preparing a non-catalog special request requisition. Now, before we do that, I want to just review some helpful hints about how to use this player. Because I want you, I mean, you leave here today, you take the keyboard training early next week, you won't have access till September 1st. So I want you, after you've done the training, to be able to come here and use this as a tool to refresh your memory and to further build your dendrite connections to these processes. So rather than start it and feel hostage to it, I want you to know how to use it. People talk about using see it just for the curious. If you want to take a nap, try see it. And the reason I say that is you, it makes you a totally passive participant that when you trigger see it, you sit back and the cursor literally at snail's pace crawls across the screen to click purchasing and then crawls across the screen to click something else. And about if it's after lunch, you're asleep already. Okay? And as adults, we learn by doing. The section that's designed for that is try it because in try it, we'll tell you click on purchasing, type in eight and a half by 11 paper, you know, click tab and it walks you physically through the process. So actually you're experiencing it, which is a good way to learn. But say you've gone a step too far, I want to show you how to back up. So in this case, if I wanted to just see it the first time before I actually take all the instruction, I'll click on try it. And I can do the same thing see it did without waiting for the cursor. All you have to do is hit the enter key and take a tour. Read the boxes, see where it goes, kind of orient yourself. Oh, I went too far. Go to the Actions menu, previous step. Sometimes it hangs up and doesn't do it. Other times it does. Say I have to leave a meeting. So if this happened, the workaround is click X and go out and start again and use Enter to get where you want to go. Say you had to stop in the middle of a meeting, you click X 
and you're out of it, you come back from your meeting, click the player, hit enter to you where you want to be. So all those actions are yours. So you can actually close the topic here, or you can go to the next step, or click the X to close it there. So you read it and start. So let's now take the lesson. So I'm going to go to, it tells you, in order to prepare an e-procurement requisition, you need to open an e-procurement module. So click on e-procurement. Click on create requisition. Now you need to identify yourself as the requester. In this case, we're going to do a lookup. Normally, I think you know who you are, and you'll probably know how you're listed, oftentimes by your ID number first, so you just key it in and hit the lookup button, and it will find you. In this case, we're looking for Brenda Lee. I'm going to say OK. So she's our requester and recreator. You'll see the new uh, box on the left there, or right over here, where we have a blank requisition so far. Hit enter, and so now we're on define requisition for creating our first page of the requisition. And again, here we have the business unit and the requester, and we've got nothing else. So we're going to go to Brenda Lee, and now we're going to give the requisition a name. So if you have five requisitions out there, this one could be laboratory supplies or something very specific so that when you have things printing out in liens and stuff, you'll see these descriptions different places. It'll be very helpful to you or when you're selecting your requisitions from a list. We're going to open up the line defaults and we're going to select our vendor. This is where you put in the selection for every line that you're going to do. Since I'm suggesting that you do one requisition per vendor like you would always do low value, I have no problem with you selecting vendor on the default page. But remember, we're on the copy from page or the copy down page. So anything you put here is merely going to reference itself further down the line on the chart string page or on the items page. So we're going to look up Fisher. Put in Fisher. Now in this module, in prior modules, we told you if you want to search contains without the Boolean options, you have percents around the word, and it'll find it anywhere. This section, the ePro section, does that automatically. So you'll see when we search for Fisher by pressing on Find, <coughs> excuse me, and then View All, we got Fisher in various places. There's one that's Fisher's in the middle somewhere. Here, Thermo Fisher. So it finds all the Fishers. And you select the one you want, and you can see that it has the address. It's in Vacaville. Now we can look at the vendor detail button. This is probably a good stop for you to take along the way, unless it's a vendor you've used a lot and you know it's there. But it's a vendor you've never used. It doesn't hurt to go look at this. So you'll click on expanding the details, and you'll see two things. You will see that the vendor is approved and open for ordering. You might have selected a vendor that's in process of being established and is not yet approved and open for ordering. So this confirms that your vendor's clean and ready to go. So we're going to say OK, and we're going to go back to return to the Define Requisitions page. Now we're going to go to the Buyer field, which is right under Vendor. And remember, Buyer, buyer determines how this rec is going to be processed. So we're going to process a direct-to-vendor, low-value order. So after a while, you're going to put in the word direct and just hit the, the look up and find it. But if you want to key it in, there is an underscore between the three words, which I find annoying. But if you put the underscore in, you're going to get it. But we're going to change the contains and say direct, just in case there was a space in front of it. Search looks. There's direct to vendor. So now you have your low value buyer identified. In this lesson, we're choosing category code and unit of measure. And this will copy down to the line that you have. And I think it's a one line order, so it's OK to put it here, because it'll copy down and you don't have to do it later. So we're going to search by description and put in lab. And there's library supplies fixtures. Because actually, we're going to buy two things. We're going to buy a sink, and we're going to buy a faucet. Unit of measure will be each. And here's a note about catalog ship to. You don't have to worry about this because this is not a catalog uh, thing. Oh, no, this is by ship to address. If you need to add ship to, this tells you the email address to send to purchasing to request another ship to for one of your office locations. Sorry about that. OK, so we're going to look up ship to. And we're going to say it contains life science. 
look up. So there's the Life Science, Valley Life Science Building 2101 will be the delivery point. If you are looking for something in University Hall and you typed in University, you get a combination of building identities with rooms and University Avenue addresses for people that are further down the road. So just it's either a street address or a building identity. Now we're going down to the shipping defaults to the due date. And they're just suggesting you put in a reasonable due date. Why is that important? Say you put in a date four weeks out and you've gotten all your stuff in three weeks and you've done your receiving and it's been paid. After that fourth week, when that date goes by, the system will scan the database for purchase orders where lines are completed and the date's passed. It'll close the order and delete the balance of the lien. If you put out to June 30th, the end of the year, that the residual lien will stay in your ledger until you ask to have it removed or it cleans up at the end of the year. So that's why they're looking for reasonable end dates. But don't make it too short if you're worried about that. Like if you know Steelcase delivers in eight weeks, you know, put it out to 10 or 12. Just some, something reasonable. So we're going to uh, select uh, a date of March 30th because this was done a while ago. And here again, you can, as I said earlier, attach someone to be shipped to someone's attention at the lab. And then remember if I said that ship to was no tax or was central receiving, I could change the location which defaults to my location to any location on campus for what could be perceived as final delivery point for that line item or for all the line items. So you can override location if you need to. So we're looking for Valley Life. We did that already. Okay, here we go. Now we're in the chart string. So we're going to put in an account. No, we don't have to, because why? The category code brings it. We might want to look at it later, see if we want to change it. But we're going to put in the fund, the department, and program codes. We're going to stop here. No, nope, she wants to do chart field one and two here, which means it'll be the same project and flex field codes on all the lines. And that's OK if that's true. If it's not, I wouldn't do it here, because you don't want to forget about it and have it go to the wrong chart string. So we're going to put one in there and one in there. And now we're ready to go to the Add Items page. Click on that link. And remember, it opened on the catalog page, but we're doing a special request. This is a non-catalog order. Special request, open special items. And there's the description you can write about what you're buying. Binders for the conference we're planning in October, or 8.5 by 11 paper and cases, or whatever. So we're going to put portable laboratory sink and tab out. Then we're going to put in a price and tab out. Quantity, we only want one of them, and we're going to tab out. This is where it's talking about bear by catalog. You can ignore this. This lesson shouldn't have had this one in there because we're not doing a catalog. OK, so you see that Fisher came from your copy page, right? And you filled in the items. And this is where you would actually choose unit of measure or category if it was blank from the copy page. So when you say add item, it goes into your little summary of the requisition, and you're ready to start line two. Line two here is going to be faucet fixtures with a price and a quantity, and vendor's the same, due date's the same, so we're ready to say add the item. We've done that. No more items to add. So all we have to do now is go to the Review and Submit page. So we go to that link. We can check the summary, make sure we haven't gone over $5,000. And now we want to confirm and finalize the distributions on each of these lines. So this is where it seems like a little extra work, because before if it was one vendor with all these orders and the distribution was once, it applied to everything. So now you have distributions and vendor and category and unit measure at the line level. And so by using copy down, when it is the same, that's going to save you lots of entry at the line level. You just do clean up and review. So we're going to open up this one. And you can see here that in addition to just this summary information, you now see ship to and due date, which you could update. We have our count, account has filled in from the default, from the category code. And you're ready to review the entire chart string to make sure it's correct. Assuming everything's correct and you're ready to save and submit, there's actually a button, Save and Preview Approvals, in case you don't want to submit it yet. 
or save and submit. We're going to do save and submit. And here is the approval notification that comes after you do that. And you'll see it's pending and it has the potential of multiple approvals. What that means is there's more than one approver for your org node and it doesn't know which one's going to take it from their work list. If there was only one approver, it would have the person's name so you'd know exactly who is doing your approval. Once the approval is done, you come back to this, you can see who the approver was. You can view a printable version of the requisition by clicking on that. And basically, we want to show distribution information, so you click on that. And so you get everything to do review. And then you go to print. And there's a full page view of it to print. Remember, I recommend doing that because of a bug in the system. It's hard to print a requisition after it's been approved and reviewed. So I do it on the way through, should you need to. But save a few trees. Remember, the data is in the computer. You don't need to attach a requisition to an invoice or an order to an invoice. All we need is the PO number on an invoice. And that's that process. Yeah? Um, no, a requisition is built on the cost of the items. And when the requisition is translated into a, a purchase order, based on the ship to identity, which is Alameda County, that 9% sales tax will be accrued on the purchase order itself. So you don't have to worry about sales tax. It's just, OK, just the cost of the item. And I think that's also true on receiving. Now, would you like to see how to retrieve a shopping catalog? Just to demystify that, because you can do that in the class, too. Um, I could also show you uh, preparing um, a catalog yourself, but I think you can go through that in class. I'd rather show you the retrieve one to show you that process. <clears throat> So I got this email that tells me that I've been assigned a cart, and this, she needs these slides by April 5th, so I better get on it. So I go to e-procurement. I go to create requisition. I choose my requester. In this case, it's Rob requester. And say OK. And now I want to look at my line defaults. And I go to the web tab now instead of special item, because we want to go to the bear by catalogs to retrieve the catalog that's been sent to me. So I go into the web tab, you'll see a SciQuest link. So when we talk about Berkeley catalogs, they're calling it bear by with SciQuest in parenthesis. So here, I would have been happy if it said bear by SciQuest, like it does everywhere else. But if you see SciQuest, that's your link. And everything we do now, including dispatching of all orders, catalog or not, goes through SciQuest module. So we're clicking on that. Here we are. So when you get to this page, you're looking for a specific cart. You're going to click on Carts. And it opens up your page, showing you your drafts and previously the ones you've signed to others. So here again, you can see if in her message or in that email it said, I sent you a cart and it was named such and such, you don't have to worry about translating the numbers from the email and remembering them to find which one you want to pull. It could say rush, because hers was a rush, and there's lab supplies or whatever, or Professor Johnson's lab, whatever works. But it'll make it easier for you to pick when there's more than one. Okay? <clears throat> so there's the title, and it's comprised of a date. March 30th of 2010, and then a series numbers, uh, a sequence number, which is not very intuitive. OK, as soon as you pull in the cart, it's going to open up and show you the items, the commodity code that comes with it. Remember, that's already brought forward, and that's also going to translate to your account code. So it's all done for you already. All this stuff will, you won't have to type any of this stuff in. It's just going to pull right into your requisition. So once we've captured the cart and you've looked at the stuff in the cart, you're ready to go, you'll say return to BFS, which means you're coming from bare buy module back into your requisition world. Say yes, I want to see this. And here you have your summary for one item at $77. And you're on the items page and ready to proceed. Now we're ready to review and complete this simple order. So we can go to the third link. 
And <clears throat> Rob Requester is listed here. And because we did use um, the defaults and filled in the items from the catalog, it has the description, the, the vendor name, the quantity, the price and total amount before tax and shipping. You would not use this link here to modify line shipping and accounting because it would let you uh, change vendors well. We just don't want you to do it there. Uh, someday we might say, yeah, but right now don't go there. <clears throat> requisition name. This is where you could name your requisition. And we chose not, I don't know if she did that. Let's see if she chose to do that. Let's see. Let me back up. This is where the action menu comes in, say previous step. Come on. Oh. Didn't like it. Anyways, you could have named the requisition so it's lab supplies rather than blank. Buyer is going to be direct to vendor. So we're going to choose direct to vendor. Now, that's line one detail. We're ready. Say OK. We can open up that line. And now we can add the due date, the ship to location. We're going to find Valley Life Sciences. Enter that there. And then we're going to put in the account code, fund, department, program, tab, chart field one. Now you can see this has been modified. It doesn't have those other fields in there. Make much easier on your eyes. So we're going to put in chart field one, chart field two. And you're ready to go. I've confirmed my chart field. I've confirmed the items in the cart are what we want. Submit. So now it shows you just like in the other one. Same process, whether it's catalog or not. You have pending approvals, and this is a confirmation page. You now have a requisition ID number, the total amount of the requisition. So you have a requisition number that you will use to look up the purchase order number when you need it later. Okay. And there's a UPK that talks about translating requisition code to PO. This is why I told you earlier, you have to know when that's going to happen. So after approval, it will become a PO if it's not a buyer within 24 hours, unless it's after the fact or special handling, which could be two to three days. <clears throat> Here, yes? So, let's say you have, um, uh, let's say you've opened up buyer, you can open up for buyers all the people in your department. Let's say, let's say you want, you're a small department and you wanted to do that. Well, and no, a buyer is your campus buyer partner in central oh, I'm sorry, purchasing. I'm using the wrong word. Okay. Okay, shopper. Good. Okay, so, so rephrase your question for me. All right. So if, if you open up buying to, or shopping to all of the people in your small right. unit, and let's say they have the option to create carts with, say, office supplies in them. So you you might have several carts with dip, off, all office supplies, let's mm -hmm. say. Can you combine them? Or is that the thing you're not recommending? Well, it depends. It, it could get very complex. If each one of them chose a single vendor and put supplies in it, you could conceivably pull in three carts into a requisition and have that burst into three orders. Okay, but then you have a requisition that's fairly complex. If they have shopping carts with multiple vendors and you combine them, you have a really complex requisition. But yes, the possibility is there. And when you're in the keyboard class, be sure to go over that with Janice and she'll explain that to you. So once I've returned to BFS, nothing stops me from going back out and looking at another cart before I submit the requisition. Okay. And just like the other system here going on, you can view the printable version, open up the chart string so you can confirm it all. Nice way to do that final check. And then you're ready to print it, and you're finished. So we're almost done today. Got a few more things to talk to you about. But I just have I demystified it. It's a little not too uncomfortable yet. It's, it's really the same data. Just have to put it in some different places, and the navigation is a little different. But the more you do it, which is why we want you to go to the UPK, the more comfortable you get with the process, and then you can focus on your transaction data, which is where your focus should be. It's about adapting to the new system, unfortunately, and that's just the process that we have to go through. The best thing is min minimize your chaos by being as curious as you can be with the whole thing, because when you're curious, you're going to learn. When you're frightened, it's like white lightning. You can't retain anything. How many of you had a temp that's been so nervous that you couldn't get them to listen? Okay, so that's what we're saying. It's like, keep it fun, just relax, you can't break it, and uh, you'll get through it. So, let's go on here. <clears throat> if my PowerPoint hasn't fallen asleep, some additional references and reminders.
There's a supplier list out on this website of the ones that are going to load. I actually gave it to you in your handout. So that's the ones you'll see by the end of the year, hopefully. Here's your assignments for the UPK. In preparation for your keyboard class, and believe me, it only takes five minutes. Look how quickly I went two of them. Certainly you want to do them for more than once and take your time. But you can see here I have three of them marked. Prepare a requisition from a hosted supplier. Retrieve a shopping cart into BFS. Those are both catalog orders. One, you do the shopping. One, you retrieve a cart. So essentially, you create your own cart. And down here, you're going to prepare a special request requisition, which is tantamount to the low value requisitions that you've already been doing. All right? So if you take those three lessons, then you're going to be prepared to do them again with the class walking through it, and it won't be the first time you're doing it. And you'll get the benefit of Janice's explanations along the way. So my important star here is doing the topics will support your success as you go to the keyboard training, because it is about repetition and familiarity. OK, say you've done this pre-training form, and you went to the keyboard class, and you've got two weeks before it's September 1st, so you can get your access. Perfect opportunity, like you have the time. But should you find some time or schedule like the first hour every morning or maybe first hour before lunch on Fridays, whenever you can feel there's a slower time in, the, in your daily life to do it, block out an hour and go do these. I want you to go take those UPK lessons that are the most relevant for your role. So if you're a rec creator, take those. How to do entertainment, how to do equipment. If you're a receiver, take that one. Take the customize the chart string down in Chartfield Maintenance. So every one that rings true to you when you look at the title, run through it. Even if it's just using try it with the enter key, my objective is to get you the UPK. Once I get you there and you find that little bead of wisdom, you'll go there again. But this is a way to stay current or stay on top of this stuff after you leave keyboard training until you have your access and you can truly use it. Or, as we say, three months from now, you have an entertainment one. Just-in-time training is waiting to help you again, okay. both the quick reference guide and the UPK. Blue card purchases remain a departmental option. Remember, at least until we have everyone on ePro, things might change again. But for now, you have that total option available. The key there is when you weigh a low-value purchase of $20 using a blue card, and all it takes is giving the documentation to the reconciler, versus these three pages to do a requisition for a $20 item. In fact, after we went live, they've already found a purchase order for $10.12. Okay? So it makes sense to use the blue card, but some people are reticent because of the lack of cooperation. So this opportunity to get people in line saying, listen, we need to be efficient here. When you buy stuff, give me the receipt for the credit card so I can reconcile. Otherwise, things get hung up in that queue and it becomes a war. So it really is about everyone on this, getting on the same page that are in your string of information access. Know your role and some responsibilities. Work with your department to establish a naming convention for your shopping carts so that it makes it easier for you to work with them. Even if it's just like when it's rush, put rush. But don't cry wolf. <laughs> Every day rush doesn't work, right? Now, how many of you are on the BFS listserv? OK, the rest of you should be, because that's how you'll hear about trainings like this or new keyboard trainings that we're going to offer, or whether the system's working, or whether they've made an enhancement or fixed something, or even changed the procedure or where you send paper. So it's critical, in my view, that everyone who is in BFS be on the listserv. And in addition to these, if you leave here today and I don't answer your questions, you can contact us at BFS version 9 about a question rather than a system problem. And here's the website where there's lots of documents posted, including all the presentations. If you go here, you can go to the training, uh, training documents page, I think it is, and all the presentations we've done since May are posted there, and this one will be there too, uh, eventually. Now, uh, the other thing is, if you have questions about a transaction you're working on, if you call the help desk number, someone's got to transcribe that into the footprints that we're tracking these with. So my recommendation is instead of relying on a translator that you email bfsbears at berkeley.edu that automatically becomes a ticket be very precise in your subject so that we know how to assign the ticket and then we're trying to get back to you we've already closed something like 1200 tickets in the last two weeks 
and there's four of us while we're doing these other things, and there's 300 we're working on. So if it feels like you're not hearing back from us, understand that we're, we're trying to take the oldest first and get through them, but we're also escalating them. Sometimes it's a system error where we're escalating to the tech team, or we're escalating to disbursements for a process issue, or we're escalating to, to procurement for a vendor fix, okay? So the more precise you can be in your subject lines, the better we can help you with those tickets. And when we send your response, you're welcome to reply to that email or reopen your ticket if we need to keep things going. It's been my pleasure, and I'll see you next time. Thanks. <laughs>